This video is a detailed look at the L network. The common L network, which is usually comprised of one inductor and one capacitor, is surrounded by many incomplete and factually often incorrect statements. SimSmith will be used to analyze the different L networks. The graphical results from SimSmith will help us understand what's really going on. Common L network statements include things like lowest loss match, lowest Q match, lowest stress on the components. People draw the conclusions it's the best matching network because of that. Let's look more closely. The SimSmith um, circuit that I have shown here is an L network that's a low-pass L network. We're running it backwards with 50 ohm load on the 50 ohms on the load, which will be the generator. The components are backwards from how they need to be, and they have negative values. So the impedances seen here will be the range of impedances you could match to if you're running SimSmith in, in the uh, normal direction. We notice that this particular circuit matches one half of the Smith chart. If we move the sh uh, shunt component to the other side, we get the other half of the Smith chart. These two configurations together can match the entire Smith chart of impedances given a very wide range of component values. These, this range of component values is actually huge, but nevertheless they can match the, the entire range. Likewise, there's a high-pass network, two high-pass networks also comprised of one inductor and one capacitor. Let's go to those. They match too, over, but they match a mirror image of what the low-pass ones did. So we take uh, this uh, this network, which matches this range. This range, we go to here. We see one that matches exactly the the other half of the Smith chart. Now that's four networks. There are two more networks. If we take this inductor and we delete this inductor and replace it with a capacitor, and we make this capacitor. Uh, be controlled with the capacitance values instead of the inductance values. And we change the control circuit to control the F component in that, the F uh, parameter in that component. We see that two capacitors can control, can match to one half of the, um, excuse me, one fourth of the Smith chart. It's this range up here. If we change the, the configuration, they still match to the same area. They match with different values, of course, but they, but they still match the same area. Two inductors would match this, this, this symmetrical area on the bottom, and I won't go through those right now. But that's eight networks together, four of them which match half the Smith chart, four more which match up to one quarter of the Smith chart. Now, you have eight networks to pick from, and no network can match the entire Smith chart. So you need to know what you're doing when you design something. If you're designing a matching network to a known impedance, that's one thing. A small range of impedances is another thing, or virtually any impedance. If you're matching to a, no, a single impedance, any four of the eight matching networks will work. If you're matching to a small range of impedances, it's possible that the range of impedances you match to would cross over a boundary like a small area like in here, and one certain networks couldn't do it. So you have to be careful about that. If you are matching to, trying to match to a wide range of networks, you're almost guaranteed that a single L network can't do it, and you have to switch components in the L network to be able to achieve that. And that's what's commercially done um, in, all, in all L network products, uh, which are designed for an, to be like antenna tuners. Now with antenna tuners especially, the impedance match trumps everything else, such as the efficiency or the ease of obtaining the match. You know, in other words, if the network doesn't match to some reasonable SWR, nothing else matters. Let's load a different uh, Smith, uh, Smith chart here. And okay, here is another. Um, kind of getting ahead of myself here. Here's another uh, version of the same thing. I'm looking at, except I'm looking at four Smith charts simultaneously. Excuse me. I'm looking at four individual circuits simultaneously. These four simultaneous circuits are all driven at a 1500 watt with a 1500 watt generator, and they all have a 50 ohm load. 
They're all circuits running backwards. And we can look at those. From, let's look at them from just a circuit point of view. Circuit A matches what we saw before with the low-pass network. Circuit D is the other side of the low-pass network. Circuit E is one of the high-pass networks. And, certain, and circuit F is the other half of the high-pass network. Together, we can see exactly what they, what they can all match. Now, if we look at the, these other four plots, which show efficiency, we can see the Smith chart is very, on the Smith chart here that the efficiency of the L network is very good. The 20 to 1 SWR circuit was shown here, and none of the L networks, all four are shown here again, none of them have a SWR that's very high, that, um, excuse me, none of them produce a loss that is very high. If we load the notes block, show the notes block again, drag it over here, the green is under 5% loss, the yellow is 5 to 10% loss, the red is 10 to 20%, and the black is greater than 20%. Let's sweep this to get a few more dots on here. We can see that all 20 to 1 SWRs, which are inside of this dotted line here, have less than 5% loss. As a matter of fact, if we raise the SWR, we can raise it up probably to somewhere, maybe just about there. Oops. There's a 39 to 1 SWR. All the, pretty much everything is less than 20% loss up to, up to 39 to 1 SWR. Excuse me, up to 10% loss. Yellow and green is within, is within the 39 to 1 SWR. If we continue to raise the SWR, We get somewhere up around 75 to 1 SWR where the loss is 20% or less, which is a very, um, very, very, you know, it's a very high SWR match to, to say the least. So the L network is very, very efficient, and that's with reasonable component values 200Q for the inductors and 2000Q for the capacitors. So let's look at what this really means, though, before we get too excited. You know, anything that sounds good always happens to have, you know, there's more to it. Let's go back to looking at not the efficiencies anymore, but just looking at the, the basic plot. And let's look at the, we're going to look at the, the low-pass networks first. This range of, capa of component values that I've picked here is, you know, staggering. 5 picofarad for minimum value to 50 nanofarads, 10 nanohenries to 100 microhenries. You can't buy that component. So let's try to make this a little more reasonable. And again, we're doing this at 10 megahertz. So at 10 megahertz, we can see that as we change these components, it really doesn't have much, it doesn't have much of an effect. And we can do it for all of them really if we want to. What we're gonna find here is that the components are, are so large and such the value is so great, and we're at this, this is in the middle of what we wanted to match that we really should be looking at probably the boundaries. So let's look at 160 meters first. If we look at 160 meters, again, we get a very, very good match here, but with these huge, huge values. Now, 160 meters is a low frequency. A low frequency needs large component values, so we will be concerned about the, lar the size of the large values. At the upper end, on 10 meters, we'll be concerned of the size of the small values. So let's take these two values here and let's start dropping them down and see what happens as we drop them down. We start to see this area of the, of the, of the Smith chart open up, which means we can no longer match to that, that area. If we drop the inductor down, we see a corresponding number up here. <coughs> If we wish to get to 20 to 1 SWR as our, as, our, as our criteria for what's an acceptable match, we can have capacitance as low as about 7,400 picofarads and the inductance 
somewhere around there. Say 18 microhenries. So we need at least 18 microhenries, and we need at least 7,400 picofarads to match 20 all 20 to 1 SWRs on 160 meters. Let's look at 10 meters. Looks good at 10 meters again. Dropping the high side values down didn't do anything. Now, 5 picofarads is a ridiculously low value to have. Stray capacitors and capacitances and stuff just do not allow us to have 5 picofarads. So if we raise the 5 picofarad value, what we start to see is instead of the outside shrinking, we're seeing the insides go away. If we said 20 picofarads is the minimum value we can have, which is not really an unrealistic value, particularly um, if you have fairly large components, um, we see a gap here. If we look at the 10 nanohenry value, which is again an incredibly ridiculous value, 10 nanohenries represents you know, less than an inch of wire uh, straight, raise that up to say something a little more reasonable. I made, made measurements in the past, somewhere around 200 nanohenries is not unreasonable. If you've got relays or you've got switches or anything else, they'd have to be, be in the circuit. We end up with what you would basically say is not a very good tuner. So 200 nanohenries. So the L network comprised of low pass networks is really pretty crappy in this range. It cannot match this on 10 meters. This is a wide range. This, it can't even match a 50 plus J50. It can't match 25 plus J0. It can't match 10 plus J0. It can't match anything in this range. So that's really, um, if you were using it on 10 meters and you had an antenna that was in this range right here, you would have to put some coax in series with it to get it down into to an area where you could match. You'd have to, you know, a piece of coax would, would move it down into, into an area where you could match. So let's look at the high pass network and see if it's actually any better. We'll get rid of the two low pass networks, go to two high pass networks. Well, 10 meters, it's a pretty crappy match too with these, with these minimum, with minimum values. It's different though. It doesn't have the gap over here, but it has a, the whole side here is, is, is missing. Not very good. Let's look at 160 meters and see if it's 160 is better than the other one was. 160 now does not have the outsides shrunk like it did before, but it has the gaps in the center. The, the high pass network really isn't any better than the low pass network, and in some ways it's probably worse. Uh, most people who build uh, commercial uh, L network tuners end up using the low pass configuration. Don't know if it's for that reason or not, but that's what they do. Let's go back to the low pass network again, real quickly. 160 meters, small area we don't match here. 30 meters. We got, a, we got a, a chunk here we don't match. 20 meters, the chunk's getting bigger. 15 meters, chunk's even bigger. By the time you get to 10 meters, chunk's pretty big. So what can we do about this? There's, there's several things we can do. Um, we can't just arbitrarily make these component value, these uh, minimum component values smaller. We can try some good practices and stuff and reduce them a little bit, but that won't get us to where we need to be. Uh, let's look at another um, okay here's another another uh, chart it does exactly what the last one did except it does it a little bit differently and let's get rid of our two high pass networks it's comprised of um, L networks that are built inside a ruse block in, in series with each inductor, though, is a capacitor, which right now is specified as one farad. One farad, of course, does absolutely nothing at RF. So it looks like zero ohms. So we see exactly what we saw before. What can be done is you can put some capacitance in series with the inductor at the high frequencies and make things better. So let's go back. We need to get these values looking like they, they looked before. 20 picofarads minimum. 200 nanohenries minimum, 4.7 nanohenries, I'm sorry, 
nanofarads and 18 microhenries. That's what we had before. We get down, we get down to 160 meters. We see we have the same circuit we had before. And capacitances won't help us there in series with inductor, but at 28 megahertz, they'll help a lot. If we take this series capacitor, and this doesn't have to be a variable capacitor, it can be a fixed capacitor, we put something in series like a thousand picofarads. We see that this started to close up. If we drop this value down, We can close it down. You can actually drop it, you can actually close it down to where down here the inductance becomes actually capacitive. It's, there's enough capacitive reactance to beat the inductive reactance if you wish. Uh, this causes a loss of efficiency, unfortunately, but it does give us matching range. We still have this matching range to contend with. And while we're at it, let's, let's look at what the efficiencies of these two networks look like. So this is network C and E. If we turn these two off, turn these two on, we will see an increase in the area where the 20% loss has, has moved in more than it did before. The 10% to 20% loss, which is red, has moved in also. But still, you know, it does match. If it matches a better area, you're better off. And it's pretty hard at 10 meters to give, to give the tuner maybe a 60 or 70 to 1 SWR. Uh, it's much easier to do that to lower frequencies where the antenna sizes are smaller. So this is not, um, this is a very reasonable thing to do. Now, unfortunately, again, it's not quite, not quite a free lunch. Um, as we drop down in frequency, let's drop down in frequency here, and what we see is things still work, but we really don't need all that, this low of a capacitance. And by the time we get down here to, to, um, Let's say, we, let's go to 20 meters approximately. Okay, 20 meters. We have a huge area in here, and if we look at the efficiencies on 20 meters, oops, we see that we're seeing even more area here where it's 20% loss or more. So the capacitor works fine. At, at 20 meters, we really didn't need all that. What we really needed at 20 meters was a lot, a lot higher capacitance would still have done the work for us. There. So something along that line right there would give us better, better efficiency and still a pretty good matching range. So inserting a capacitor in series with an inductor will fix these problems, but you have to kind of be careful. One value doesn't fix them for all bands. So let's go back here again to where we were just a minute ago with, I'm sorry, C and E again. Hard to keep all these straight. And if we go to um, 10 meters, and we let's pick an impedance out here somewhere. Uh, Right here. Let's suppose we were given this impedance to try to match. This topology L network does not get there. This topology L network does not get there. The closest thing we can do with this network network is probably a point right here. The closest one with this one is probably somewhere here or here. What does this mean if we're given that? It doesn't mean that the tuner doesn't work. It just means that it doesn't work to a one-to-one -one match. All these points on, underneath these this gridded line meant we were capable of getting to a one to one SWR if we had infinite number of values we could pick from. So let's load another, um, another chart here. So remember this is 100 minus J200. Okay, 100 minus J200 is the, are, the two term, are the two load impedances and I've done both tuners the same as before with minimum 20 picofarad capacitance and the inductance value I need for minimum minimum loss. The orange circuit, the inductor acts first, and there's 20 picofarads down there. 
So if we were to basically change, and we can run these circuits in the forward direction because we know the load impedance at this point in time. So if we change the 20 picofarads to 18, 17, 16, we see that line getting better. So basically, pretty much the lowest value we can get, the lowest SWR is going to be right here with those component values. And that means that when we had this circuit adjusted, as best we could do, we have a 2.099 SWR. The purple circuit, or the pink circuit here, actually works better. With a 20 picofarad capacitor and a 639 nanohenry inductor, we match to this point right here, which is a 1.577. So if, if you were willing to say a 1.577 to 1 SWR is good enough, then that gap in the, in the, uh, in the, Smith, in the, Smith, in the Smith chart from the previous, um, the previous circuit would, would be great. So one, one more quick side here. As, as the gap is big down here, these will these two points would probably match to 1.1 to 1 SWR. I mean, clearly, if I'm at this point right here, let's put a let's put a small SWR on the circuit. Here's a 2 to 1 SWR graph. If I'm in here, I don't even need a circuit to match to less than 2 to 1 SWR because this is the 2 to 1 SWR circle. I don't need to do anything. So down here it's easier. Up here it gets harder. As we move further and further and further up here, we will even be we will have higher and higher SWR when we're in this no man's area. By making the no man's area uh, smaller, that means the matched SWR will drop, which will be good. But, you know, I'm, I'm reporting what it does. This is, this, is, this is what you get. Let's look at something else here real quickly, and this, this video is getting to be longer than I was kind of hoping, but uh, let's look at one other thing here. Comment about the, the matching efficiency in Q. Here's two L networks, both directions. I'm matching 200 plus J0 to 50 ohms. The first L network, again with Qs of 200 for the inductor and 2000 for the capacitor, is shown in these two arcs. The second circuit, which is the counterpart to it, the high pass version, is shown in those two arcs, the green and the red. Both of these match nicely. Here's a four element matching network, which matches not quite to two to one, or excuse me, not quite to one to one SWR from there, but Let's look at the efficiencies of all of these. 1486 watts, 1486 watts, 1485 watts. One watt less efficient with this four element network. But let's look at the four element network in, in a little more detail. Let's look at the SWR that we would get here um, at point D. That's the SWR versus frequency if we wanted to use this as a broadband match. It has the classic low pass uh, network um, uh, curve. Let's look at the next network. It has the classic high pass network. High pass network. Look. Let's look at the four element network. Look how wide it is. It's much wider than the others. Much more useful. If at 1.5 to 1 SWR was what your your goal was, this circuit would match from 14.6 megahertz down to 6.7. This would cover 40 and 20 meters both with a match, where this network would only go from 8.5 to 11, or this one would go from 8.8 .8 to 11.7. .7. So this network is obviously a lower Q network than these networks are. So the L network is clearly not the lowest Q network you can have. You can think of this as, as several L networks. You can think of it as two L networks combined. Um, but there's there's other networks that do a pretty good job. The efficiency of this network is not any is not any worse than the efficiencies of these two networks. So the statement about L networks being always the best match, I don't know if it's true or not. It may, they, may, they may be as good as anything else, but there are other circuits just as good. As far as being the lowest Q match, well, clearly in this case, there was another match that was better. Um, is it the best matching network? Well, I don't know about that one. Um, if we go back to the, one of the early graphs again, we find that the requirement to have to have 20 to 7,400 picofarads is a pretty onerous um, task. That means if you had a variable capacitor, you could get part of the way, you have to switch banks of capacitors in. Um, to go from 218 microhenries, 200 nanohenries to 18 microhenries might be able to be done on a roller inductor. Um, you have to be a little bit careful about how, you're, how you orient it and stuff. You'd want the rotating part of it back towards the capacitor, not 
towards the um, front end of the, of the network um, so that the lead links would be shorter. This is doable. This is not so doable. And this is the weakness in the L network. The component values are not always as convenient as you'd like them to be. And because of that, um, you look at the commercial tuners, and the commercial tuners have somewhere around 4,000 picofarads of capacitance here. They have relays that do steps, and the steps of relays that you have um, determine lots of things. Um, a, good, a good tuner may have eight steps. So that's 256 values you can have. They're binarily weighted, 256 values of inductance, 256 values of capacitance. Well, 256 values of inductance that are in series, it's going to be pretty tough to maintain 200 nanohenries minimum circuit when you have seven relays that are shorted out and they all have a little loop in them, which is the contacts. Likewise, 20 picofarads is pretty hard to, to get if you've got a lot of relays switching in capacitance banks. Um, 20, pic, 20 picofarads times 256 gets you about 5,000 picofarads. So the step size would be 20, 23 or 24 picofarads, something like that. And that's getting to be maybe a little bit too big for 10 meters. So it's a constant battle um, as to how many steps you have, what the minimum component values are. And I don't think anybody really knows what they've got uh, in their tuner. I've measured some tuners. Um, you know, when they work for you, you're happy. When they don't work for you, you're not happy. But, um, you know, this is pretty much the, the, the gist of what, what goes on with the L network. Uh, it is efficient. It is easy to design. And... Uh, Hope you've enjoyed this.